Good morning, everyone. Last time we we ended talking about what to do in a surplus. Uh, and we said if there's too much supply and not enough demand, you can try number one to increase demand, number two, decrease supply, or number three, set the price at the equilibrium, which is best for everyone. Let's look at that a little more clearly, a little more in depth. Uh, so the first idea is increased demand. There is surplus because not enough people want to buy what you are producing. So make them want it. And that really means uh, advertising. Uh, use advertising to make people want what they would not otherwise want. Uh, this is the best option for the producers because they have all this stuff. They want to keep on producing as much as they are producing. They just need more customers. Uh, so you try to convince people to buy your things, even at a price higher than the current equilibrium that increases the subjective value that people have and pushes the equilibrium higher so people are willing to buy more at the same uh, price. This can get very... Uh, unethical very quickly as you are trying to convince people to buy things that they don't want or maybe don't need. Uh, so you got to be really careful if you are the boss, uh, that you are advertising fairly, that you are explaining your product well. It's fine to try to get people to buy your product. I'm sure you all went around telling people to buy your pizza, uh, but we should not be lying. We should not be manipulating people into buying things they don't want. That's really no good. All right. All right. Um, yeah, trying to shift the equilibrium upward by making people buy things that they would not buy um, normally. Another unethical thing that goes along with this is just trying to destroy rival products and goods. If another company is producing a similar good or the same good, that is in fact part of the surplus. So if I can destroy my rivals, that um, leaves more customers for me. Uh, again, it's part of business to try to out compete with your rivals, but we need to be careful the way that we do that. Uh, but you can try to destroy your rivals with negative ads saying, you know, how terrible their products are. It's what politicians do. Um, and aren't voters kind of like customers trying to steal customers from my opponent? Uh, you can try to buy your, uh, your competitor and make them part of your uh, supply chain. That's what a lot of big businesses do. There's competitors, so they buy them out, and now they're not a competitor anymore. Uh, maybe you can convince the government to make a regulation maybe to raise the price of foreign made goods and that hurts your foreign competitors imports and therefore leaves more customers for you. Or you can try to convince the government to buy your surplus and that happens as well. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, when the government buys the surplus, uh, it, that forces prices up as supply goes down because the government buys that stuff and often takes it off the market. For example, they do this with a lot of farm goods. You buy a million bushels of corn and then just leave it in the silo, not selling it. Therefore, it's not surplus anymore because it's not on the market. It still exists, but it's not for sale. So it is not considered part of supply any, anymore. That gets the prices higher than they would be without the government interference. And that is called a price floor, where prices cannot go below this setting because there's not enough supply. But the only reason there's not enough supply is that the government is buying that stuff. Uh, this is great for the producer. It forces consumers to pay more than they otherwise would in a similar circumstance. So it's great for the producer. It's bad for the consumer though. You can see here, anything north of the equilibrium point, which is right here, anything north of that is a surplus. So if the government buys this much, then that sets a price floor where you cannot have um, the prices lower than that and still make a profit. Great for the producer, bad for the consumer. Uh, many, many farm goods are subsidized by the government. The government spends hundreds of billions of dollars a year buying farm goods. Uh, and that is because they think that farms cannot make a profit or can't make a very good profit these days. Uh, maybe they're right. Uh, so the government feels like if they did not subsidize these goods, then a lot of farmers would go out of business and then America would not be a farming nation anymore. Uh, and that very well may be true. Uh, 
like many of our other jobs have gone overseas, uh, maybe our farming jobs would go overseas as well if the government did not subsidize them. Um, so subsidizing, I usually am not a big fan of it, but I'm not saying it's always a terrible idea. I do want to keep jobs of all kinds in America. That does require paying more than we normally would though. So the first way to uh, deal with the surplus is increased demand. The second one is decreased supply, um, which is partially what the government does when it subsidizes. It, it increases demand by decreasing supply. Um, when it increases demand, that means the government is buying things that it doesn't really need. You know, the government buys silos full of corn that the government doesn't want itself. It's just trying to help. And that also decreases supply by taking all that corn off the market and uh, bringing you back to the equilibrium point. If you want to keep your prices high, then you have to sell less. If you keep your prices high, people aren't going to buy as much. So you, you have to produce less because people are buying less. This is now making a new equilibrium. Uh, it is removing the surplus by making less of the same thing because you don't want to budge that profit point. As you produce less, you create more scarcity. Creating more scarcity means people are willing to buy the, the amount that you produce. And now we've created a new equilibrium. This is really not a great idea if you have lots of competitors that are selling the same thing because you are keeping your price artificially high and making not very much. And from your point of view as the producer, there's not very much of your item. But next door and down to the street and the next town over, there's lots of other producers that are making lots and lots of the same thing. So there's scarcity for your brand, but there's not scarcity for that item in total. And if you keep your prices higher than your competitors, well, then people might just go there uh, when, when they don't have any scarcity. So this only really works if you get all the uh, competitors working together, which is illegal in America. Uh, or you have a monopoly or a near monopoly, which is also illegal in America. Um, different competitors are not allowed to all agree to raise prices or keep prices high. They did this with the butter industry. All these different big dairy brands years and years ago uh, all gathered together and said, we will artificially raise our prices. And if we all raise our prices at the same time, then no one uh, can can buy someone else's brand of butter for cheaper. And they got in trouble and got fined like millions of dollars by the government. <laughs> but by far the best way to deal with a surplus when I've made more than is selling is simply to set the price at the equilibrium. In fact, this is the best idea always. You always want to get the price at the equilibrium. Uh, the problem is equilibrium is constantly changing left and, left and right and up and down. Uh, so we've got to continually adjust. Uh, but the best way to sell the most stuff at the best prices is to find the equilibrium and make your prices at the equilibrium. And when the equilibrium changes, change your prices too, up or down. This is the easiest reaction. It's the best reaction and it's the most obvious reaction. And all the, the healthy companies in America do this. Because if they don't do this, they're not going to be a healthy company for very long. They're going to be missing out on a lot of, uh, a lot of profit. Uh, the market equilibrium is the price at which consumers are willing to buy the most at the best price, which is best for everyone. It's best for the consumer and it's also best for the producer. Uh, so how do you know what the equilibrium is? When I find myself with prices higher than the equilibrium and I have a surplus, well, slowly lower the prices and figure out at, at what at what point are people buying exactly the same amount that I'm producing? You lower prices a little bit and that surplus goes down. You lower prices a little bit more, that surplus goes down. Lower prices a third time and there's no more surplus. Perfect, you got it spot on and we'll keep it at that price for a short while. Best solution for everyone. All right, what about the opposite of a surplus, a shortage? When there's more demand than supply, there's a shortage. So when there's more supply and than demand, that is an excess, a surplus above you. Anything lower than the equilibrium point means there's a shortage. People want more than what is being produced. This is obviously impossible. Uh, 
if there's only so many items produced and people want more than that, they buy it all and then there's no more. Shelves are empty. People cannot buy what they wanted to. This is also bad for both producer and consumer. The producer is missing out because they're not selling the item that everyone wants. They're missing out on profit from things that are not being sold because they haven't made them yet. It's bad for the consumer because there's plenty of consumers who want an object and they can't get it. Shortages occur when the price is below the equilibrium. The price is low enough that producers don't feel like producing. Uh, since sellers did not intentionally set the prices too low. I mean, who in their right mind would intentionally set prices too low? It's obviously something happened that made the equilibrium go up or made supply go down. Uh, but that's why uh, prices need to change constantly. If you are the boss, if you are the producer, you need to keep your eye on things. And when there is about to be a shortage, you need to raise those prices. Anyway, uh, this usually happens. There's a shortage when the equilibrium shifts faster than the producers react. And sometimes big companies are very slow to react. Um, governments are usually notoriously way, way slower than producers still, uh, which is one problem with the government meddling with the economy. The economy shifts constantly and the government just can't react very fast. On occasion, of course, there's always uh, there's always exceptions. On occasion, people create a shortage on purpose by lowering the price on purpose. And they usually do this when they set uh, the price of product A way too low, so they're losing money on product A. Everyone rushes in the door to get product A. And the company does that, so they're in the door to also buy B, C, D, E, and F. That's why Costco pizza and hot dogs are insanely cheap. Costco rotisserie chicken is like five bucks, even though it's probably worth more like eight. Uh, they lose money on that, create a shortage on that, and then everyone rushes in to buy that and buys a whole bunch of other junk along the way. Or maybe if you're closing down or you're moving locations or for whatever reason, you need to sell everything. Everything must go. You have this crazy sale. Like Big Al's shut down, and in the last few weeks that they were open, they had ridiculous sales. I went in with Clara and Molly once, and they're like, here, have a couple toys for the kids for free. I'm like, oh, okay, thanks. They're not making money on that. They just need to get rid of everything in the store one way or another. Sometimes governments compel prices lower than the equilibrium. They set prices lower than they should be. Uh, when I say should, I mean all things being equal, the prices would be at the equilibrium. The government says no, the prices have to be down here. Uh, they do that to try to make things affordable to the poor, which is not a bad idea, uh, but it's also not great for the economy. And I'm going to be making this speech quite a bit this semester. Remember, capitalism tells you how to make the most money. It does not necessarily tell you the right thing to do. Uh, so when we look at the government meddling with the economy, often we get very frustrated and say, well, that's not making the most money. Well, that's not the only thing the government has to consider. Uh, if there's people who can't afford food, should we help them? Sure. And, and there's lots of different ways to help people uh, and get what they need. This is one of them. Uh, it, it does create problems in the economy. Um, but you've got to consider, is creating this shortage worth helping these people and uh, you got to make that decision. Unfortunately, there's always side effects when the government tells the economy what to be like and the side effects for the government setting prices too low is that there's not enough for the poor people at those lower prices because if the government sets prices too low, producers won't produce enough and now there's not enough for everyone to, to go around. Uh, even though it would be cheap if you could get any, you can't get any. That's called a price ceiling. So a price floor is when the government won't let the price go below this line or whatever. The price ceiling is when the government won't let the price go above that line. Price ceilings always cause shortages. Whenever the government tries to make things more affordable, it will always create shortages. Uh, one way to get around that is the government forcing producers to produce a certain amount of something, which most people go, yeah, I don't like the government telling me what kind of job I need to have and, and do and, and produce. 
I mean, we did that in World War II. You must produce X number of tanks, but we typically won't do that if we're not involved in a world war. Price ceilings can create such a loss of profit for the producers that the producers go out of business, and then that leads to a, an even more drastic shortage. That's not good. Uh, it's good for the consumer, obviously, because prices are low. Yay for the consumer. Really bad for the producer. Whenever the government makes the economy do something it would not do normally, either setting prices too high or setting prices too low, that's called market manipulation. And that always causes problems. Price floors hurt consumers, price ceilings hurt producers, but in reality, both are hurt by both. Uh, consumers and producers are really the same people. We're all human beings. We all need to eat food. We all need to make money. Where do you think those consumers are getting a paycheck from? They're getting a paycheck from the producers. So if you lower prices so low that your your business, you know, your job goes out of business, they lay you off. And now even with low prices, you're not getting a paycheck. Ah, that's a problem. Uh, whenever the government manipulates the market away from market equilibrium, it's hurting everyone because equilibrium is the exact point that is best for everyone. Uh, now, sometimes the government thinks that they're hurting everyone a little bit to help some people an awful lot. So is the benefit higher than the cost? There's always a cost. Is the benefit higher than that? And that's just something you have to take by a case by case basis. I don't think the government should be 100% hands off from the economy because then that leads to uh, evil bosses doing wicked things, lying, cheating, stealing. That's not good for people either. Uh, but the more the government meddles in the economy, the further away from the best fair price, the equilibrium price, uh, things get. And so the more the government meddles, the worse the economy gets. And at some point, the damage is way worse than the benefit that they're hoping to get from that manipulation. Suppose the government wants to help poor folks get affordable housing. Great idea. There's people who can't afford housing and we don't want them to be homeless. So you know, let's, let's help people. How are we going to help people? And America is the richest nation in the world. Can we afford to help people? Yes, we can. Uh, so one way that the government tries to help provide affordable housing is saying every landlord needs to have X percent of their apartments or whatever set at this affordable housing rate. It's below market level. So if you own 100 rental units, 10 of your rental units must have a rent no higher than 500 bucks a month or whatever. Uh, but then as years go by, inflation sets in and all of a sudden the the landlord is not getting a profit on those properties. Uh, maybe the, the price of um, maintenance on that property is so high that he can't afford to maintain it. So there's broken windows that get covered up in cardboard. You know, there's carpet that just doesn't get replaced for decades and it's all old and nasty. Maybe there's a broken refrigerator or sink and he doesn't want to pay to fix it because he's just not getting a profit. Uh, and then people get out of the landlord business. If you can't make money with rental properties, no one wants to provide rental properties. And these rich people take all their uh, landlord money and they go into whatever other business will make them money. Now there's not enough housing because there's not enough landlords. And because there's not enough housing, supply goes way down. Demand is still whatever it was. There's a shortage and prices for everyone skyrocket. Uh, government help in uh, in affordable housing is usually very well um, meant, but it always has long-term consequences. I remember uh, President Trump's uh, secretary for uh, housing and urban development, uh, Ben Carson, uh, he ran for president and, and lost the primary to Trump. Um, he went out to check on some of these government projects, they're called, and he got stuck in the elevator. Um, secretary, uh, level cabinet level minister got stuck in the elevator for several hours. Why? Because the landlord of that apartment building was getting so little profit that he was not maintaining the elevators correctly. So we have a top government official embarrassed, <laughs> stuck in an elevator for a few hours as they find someone to, to dig him out of there. Um, not great. A 
better idea is for the government not to artificially reduce the price of rent, but to help out with the rent. So say that rent can still remain high enough for uh, the landlord to make a profit, but the poor person only has to pay three quarters of that rent and the government will pay the extra quarter of that. That way the landlord sells enough profit, there will be more people going into the landlord business, more apartments will be built because they can make a profit on those apartments, etc. That does cost money though, and now the government is giving all this money to landlords, that requires higher taxes. Uh, the higher the taxes are, the more money you're taking out of the economy. It is a better solution in the long run. It's still not a, a perfect solution, uh, but I do think that's the better way to go. Three solutions to shortages we will talk about next time. Number one, you could discourage demand. You only have a few of them, figure out how to make people say, do I really need this product? And tell people to buy something else. Number two, you could increase supply. And that is usually a, a very good solution long-term, but for right now, it may take a while to increase supply. For instance, how do you increase the supply of houses? You need to build more houses and that's not something you do tomorrow. That can take years um, to build a whole new neighborhood. And lastly, the best solution always, raise prices to meet the equilibrium. And we'll talk about these more in depth next time. Bye.